All right. Welcome, pretty Padnaik. It's very nice to see you. Thank you. Uh, today, we are going to speak uh, about a lot of different topics, and that's why I, I'm so pleased to have you today. You are an uh, editor of a blog that is called a Health, uh, Geneva Health Files, right? Yes. And right. also, you're also a mother. You're my neighbor, actually. <laughs> uh, what do I miss in your resume? Um, well, it's... Uh Uh, first of all, thank you for having me over and um, thank you to your listeners. Um, it's, a, it's a privilege to speak to you and your listeners. Um, yes, I'm your neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'm um, an Indian journalist um, and I have uh, been in uh, Switzerland um, studying and working in Geneva for uh, the last 10 years. Um, and um, I report a lot on global health and trade and uh, recently have started publishing a website that's called uh, Geneva Health Files mm. that basically tracks um, the governance of global health. A lot of important decisions around health get done in Geneva, but not only um, health because, you know, Geneva is a unique ecosystem um, of lots of different uh, international organizations and collectively there are lots of influences that come to shape this ecosystem so that's uh, it's a fascinating uh, place to be in and a good um, opportunity for a journalist to sort of observe and you know um, uh, sort of capture what's happening and what doesn't get said um, what else on my resume uh, well I I, um, I was born in India I grew up in India and I um, uh, worked Uh, with uh, a few Indian newspapers uh, for the first five years when I started in journalism. And then I um, went to study economics um, and reporting uh, in New York University um, in the U.S. for uh, two or three years uh, because I was a science student uh, and I was writing for financial newspapers. So I thought it's a good idea to know a little bit of economics. Um, and then um, I moved to Switzerland um, because my husband uh, worked here mm -hmm. and uh, and I also ended up uh, studying uh, development studies and that basically introduced me to the world of international development and specifically uh, global health um, so yeah that's that's a short uh, intro yeah <laughs> thank you we live in a very interesting time eh? and I think uh, for your work in, in health industry it's also particularly Um, special with the COVID uh, and all what is happening. So when we think about COVID, we usually scrutinize the behavior and the answer of the countries, country by countries. But rarely, and that's also why I was so interesting to uh, discuss with you, uh, we, we need to have a look in the international response to it. And uh, since you were specialize or you have a, you masterize the the UN organization that works around also the answer of the covid i'm thinking about it. each um, world health organization world trade organization as well um, to me it's very distant i don't really know how it works and what they do so maybe you can introduce us a little bit of me to to your work around that that felt what is happening As a, as a worldwide, a global, international response toward the, the COVID? Um, it's, it's complex, um, and it, it has been complex even before COVID. Um, and, um, you know, the World Health Organization um, was created uh, nearly 70 years ago, um, and uh, it has basically um, 194 countries who are members of the World Health Organization. Um, So when we talk about WHO, it is all these countries. Uh -huh. So it's a, it's a multilateral organization. And um, so they do a whole um, range of um, uh, activities from formulating scientific guidance on how um, countries uh, must um, uh, follow and adapt some of the guidance and, and their practice of public health in their own countries. But they also do emergency work. Uh, so, so basically, right now you're seeing it in action, right? They're, how they work with countries on COVID. Um, the Ebola crisis uh, in Africa was a good example of how they would um, basically um, uh, respond to emergency situations. 
so that is also very much a part of their uh, mandate mm-hmm. so um, so it's so they do a whole range of tasks and it's kind of difficult to appreciate uh, how much they do with mm. such limited uh, uh, financing um, you know it has been said that uh, a university hospital in in a uh you know in a big city in a big western city probably has more budget than the world health organization which is uh, which is uh, hard to believe um so so they they are responsible for so we, let's talk about covid so if, if you're talking about covid vaccines if and when they come out who will be giving technical guidance on okay is this from from you know based on uh the experts who work with them this vaccine is safe and therefore uh, we certify that this vaccine is safe and then uh, countries can go and take their own decisions mm-hmm. um so that's just one technical part of it and then um apart from the science and the public health work it is also a very um sort of uh, uh political mm-hmm. right i so, think so yeah yeah because because is, is usa pulling out of, of yes that's what they have financially they said i don't know if they are going to do it yes uh, they they have said that in the next one year they will Mm-hmm. uh but uh the mechanics of if and how uh remains to be seen yeah um and uh, it's it's a big question because um america is uh, deeply uh, integrated at all levels of um uh, uh you know public health science uh, across the world american mm-hmm. institutions have been instrumental in influencing uh public health choices and policies Uh, across the world mm-hmm. so what uh, it means for the us to pull out of the world health organization remains to be seen mm-hmm. um you know come november we we will yeah. know whether well, or not that will happen and so on and so forth uh, but but the only thing i'll add here is uh, many multilateral institutions are political including the world health organization and the world trade organization it's the very nature of these institutions you know countries come together they uh, they negotiate the bargain um uh, they put their interests um up there and and all of this revolves around how uh, how the stakes are managed how the resources are divided how it's communicated um so it's a so it's an interesting it's an interesting ecosystem yeah mm-hmm. yeah I, i think i remember watching a video of um, a journalist asking a chinese representative uh no i think it was one of the head of the who and he mentioned taiwan and i think he went really bad the guy like faked he wasn't hearing properly and then the second times the journalist asked then he said we're done and then he cut or something apparently it's very sensitive like the it's very politicized as you said yes um, so can we rely on it then because if it's only about putting power of nations um no i think yes we can rely on it um um uh, you have to uh, kind of be uh, cautious about the fact that no matter uh, who runs these organizations it's always going to be a a a, a tight rope to walk between major powers uh, so so as as i've reported and i've written um i think um uh, a crisis like uh, the covid crisis or um uh, these organizations become like a playground of sorts for geopolitics um so you see you see um a lot of um, so so yes this is about health but it is also political so i'm not i'm not sure about the specific uh, incident you're talking about mm-hmm. but uh, y- there have been a lot of discussions about uh, taiwan um with respect to the uh, covid crisis um whether uh, they should be more deeply involved um and china is not in favor of it and other nations um are in favor of it and you know it's a it's a whole back and forth negotiation um and yes it's quite uh, quite political mm-hmm. but for the external eye like me is like kind of discrediting the whole thing because the this seems to be arguing on think we don't really know or understand when we think the who uh, is supposed to focus on health only you know um um well i think that's a that's a that's a that's a misnomer in the sense mm. that yes it's it's just yeah. you know health is political as well sure, yeah uh, <laughs> it is absolutely a, a country actually, yeah, yeah a country deciding to spend on health that's mm. a political decision mm-hmm. uh it's it's a decision that feeds back uh in voter behavior and in elections and you and you see that you know it's 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 political on many levels uh, the decision to divert funding from yeah. uh, defense expenditure to health is a political decision so health is political so it's 
um you, it's nothing to be surprised about that no, the absolutely. who is a political space mm-hmm. as well more than ever actually because yes. when you look at nations uh you can s- everywhere like uk you can see the problem with the nhs are we going to privatize that's the conservative or the labor no don't touch it it's public yes. this uh, this debate is everywhere in the world in switzerland every year we have also political debates because we they increase you know the les assurances sociales every year so that's and then everyone discuss it and we propose ideas to either privatize it more or publicize um yeah. make it in the domain public yeah mm-hmm. so in the in the context of uh, who what's interesting is um the kind of the kind of um issues that get more funding easily as opposed to some of the neglected areas um that's also sort of interesting to see um so for mm-hmm. instance things like non communicable diseases uh, which is traditionally uh, you know cancer and uh, mm-hmm. things of that kind which has you know you see rising burden of non communicable diseases uh in in some of the poorer countries and and worldwide as well um but uh the money for this within the who scheme of things has not been as forthcoming um and those are also political issues mm-hmm. yeah. uh, as opposed to only spending um overwhelmingly broadly in global health on infectious diseases mm-hmm. yeah. so uh so yeah i think the the issue of what is political takes many undertones yeah yeah, yeah. and what is the role of the big farmers they because obviously when it's something is global means there's a lot of money to make or not make and we see some weird thing happening be- behind the curtains uh, now nowadays the last stuff i remember was trump booking the the future potential vaccine like buying everything how does it work is that possible i mean how who has the power to constraint or to share equality yeah um i think that's a big question uh and you should ask the political leaders <laughs> <laughs> that would be uh who's response uh but but i think the um the current crisis is a particularly complicated time but it, it's a time where some of these urgent questions which people have been talking about equality in the access to medicines for mm, instance exactly yeah. um they have been talking about it for for many many years but but because of the pandemic it has become even more urgent and it's even more striking in that sense um so um who um does not have a uh, rule making powers in that sense mm, it okay. cannot enforce rules it seems like it yeah. but it can bring together people and uh, you know generate political will and um and um formulate the right kind of policies yeah. so so right now it's trying to um work on a, a framework um on trying to arrive at a solution on when the vaccines become v- vaccines or medicines and diagnostics become available for covid-19 how are they going to um sort of ensure that uh, it it's obviously um, they say that not everyone can get it at the same time but people most at risk will get it first and then uh, they they go through different rounds it's unclear but um you know the free market sort of rules even in the height of the pandemic mm. so so yes you have a uh, company striking deals with uh, some of the rich countries not just uh, not just the us um not so switzerland it, had reached the deal like last week i think uh, also with vaccine yes they bought 10 million no yeah. i don't remember how many million yeah they they have said that um uh, a bunch of different countries have sort of uh expressed interest in in buying up vaccines yeah. for their respective populations and so on but but the but the logic is simple in the sense that if countries come together and pool their money um then they will be able to obviously negotiate better mm. more number of doses mm. at a lower price okay. for more number of people yeah. uh but uh that may or may not be suitable uh for pharmaceutical industries you know looking for um uh, you know looking for basically um uh to profit but mm. although some have said that they don't intend to profit um in the duration of the pandemic but one really has to l- sort of look closely um at the contracts um and and the clauses in the contracts yeah. that say that 
uh, at what price will you sell for how long yeah. how long do you expect the pandemic to go on and so forth so these are sort of questions that are uh, coming up now and you know every day for the last few months people have been discussing and putting their heads together it's extremely complex and you have you know more than 200 countries in the yeah. world uh, affected by this and very emotional as well because we're talking about actually life and death yes and um, this pandemic is so apparently we were so unprepared for such an event that um, no one really knows where or how to deal with it. Yeah, it is interesting. Um, and, uh, you know, early in the pandemic, I had the opportunity to speak with one of the uh, top WHO officials. Mm -hmm. And uh, what he said was actually sort of counterintuitive um, that, you know, a lot of the rich countries uh, sort of failed to anticipate uh, the magnitude of the crisis and to prepare for it. Sure. Uh, and international organizations such as WHO had assumed certain capabilities uh, in rich countries uh, that, you know, they're going to have a good public health infrastructure that's going to stop the infection at the borders and they're going to yeah. go do good surveillance and so that. on. Yes, they mm. assumed that, but mm. a lot of the countries actually... Um, Did not. Uh, yeah, they, they, they sort of let their guard down. Mm. But um, right now, things have changed a lot since the early days. But uh, at, at that point... Uh, he he mentioned that a lot of uh, countries, uh, uh, including in Africa, w for example, um, were actually wired to cope with emergencies like this uh, because of their experience with lots yeah. of other health History. emergencies, with um, you know with their uh, experience in conflict settings, uh, with natural disasters. Uh, so so, um, in some sense, they were alert and you know uh, better prepared. Um, but one has to sort of see how they're faring now. But uh, it was interesting that uh, an experienced person who had worked with health emergencies actually had more faith uh, in health systems of some of the mm. um, uh, poorer countries. Yeah. Um, and uh, so that, that, that was actually fascinating. Mm -hmm. As you see also, Africa is, seems to be, for now, uh, least um, affected uh, by the, the COVID, but it may change because now it's like South America yes. that is speaking. And so, also Asia. Yeah, but um, Africa ha had to deal with uh, lots of different diseases uh, for decades now. So maybe they're actually the ones who are more prepared, uh, and I hope so, yeah. in, the, in the future. Yeah. So you just mentioned India, and that's also a, so, a topic that uh, you you uh, you know a lot because you're from there and uh, actually it happened to be a approximately one year ago that uh, Kashmir the region of Kashmir lost its autonomy because India's uh, governments Modi's governments apparently decided so unilaterally um, I have a deep connection to India myself, first of all, because I went there, but uh, also, obviously, because my sister is born there. And uh, also, it's when we think global, which I'm trying to, to do to understand the world, um, and we realize that India is a country with 1 billion, 300, uh, I think 280 million people, Kind of, I think it's like 50 million away from China, or it's very close to China and will probably catch up China very soon. But we hear so, so few about India, you know, we, in Switzerland, we are very protected from what's happening, happening there. I don't know if it's because no one is really interested, interested about that, or if it's because there's a lack of information coming out of it because I'm not sure about the freedom of expression uh, there. So that's also, I was looking forward to, to, to meet you to, uh, to really discuss uh, these topics profoundly. So maybe to keep me, like to, to start with, uh, can you try to describe the situation in India now politically? How is it going? It's a vast question and I don't know where you can start, whatever, <laughs> that would be fine. Um, yes, it's a it's a vast question and uh, and complex uh, and depending on who you talk to, it can also be a very simple question. Mm. Uh, so, I think um, it's uh, we we are experiencing um, a churn 
uh, even now during the pandemic, uh, a, a churn that we are not sure um, how, you know, what kind of outcomes it will generate. Um, as um, as you know that, you know, I've spoken about this uh, several times in mm -hmm. the in the past uh, also with you. Um, I think uh, as uh, it's it's been about uh, 10 or 12 years since I left the country. Uh, but I obviously continue to be sort of deeply involved in yeah. uh, and, and, you know, have a lot of interest in, in totally. how it's. Uh, how it's uh, uh, being governed, and uh, and not just because my my family, um, you know, lives there, uh, but but also um, you know obviously have a deep continue to have a deep connection. Um, but uh, having stayed away also has given me that objective distance uh, to actually see things um, mm -hmm. in a in a calmer manner. Mm -hmm. um, so so to um, answer your question, I think what's uh, happening in India is unfortunately not very different from what's happening in many other parts of the world, um, which is to say that um, it is, um, you know, overwhelmingly going in one direction. Um, and um, it is going uh, really far away from uh, the goals of our constitution. Um, and, um, and relatively speaking, India is a is a is a is a young country. You know, we we, we got our independence only uh, from in, England uh, from England in 1947. Um, but at that point of time, we had um, uh, you know our, our founding fathers, as it were, came together and crafted a really progressive uh, constitution. Um, and um, uh, I'm not an expert on this, and in fact, there have been a lot of uh, uh, recent books on on what the constitution set out to do, and you know, I, I would urge uh, your listeners to mm -hmm. check them out. Um, so essentially, uh, in one stroke, um, you know, all Indians were given the right to vote, um, and it was um, a very unique decision uh, for such a new democracy. Um, and so, what what experts have pointed out is that the founding fathers had a vision of what this constitution will entail. It was about um, basically uh, endowing, sort of giving a political culture to a people. And 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 the assumption was that people will own that culture, grow into, into that culture, mm -hmm. um, you know, basically the spirit, the, you know, the spirit of democracy, the spirit of uh, diversity, um, and, and of course... Um, what has become contentious of late is, of course, um, the freedom of choice uh, on everything, right? On what you eat, what you wear, and who you pray to, and so on and so forth. Um, so, so, so politically, it's it's basically has become dominated a lot by by religious fundamentalism, uh, but that has begun to color ev all aspects of public life. Mm -hmm. So, so. So to answer your question in in so many it can be answered in so many yeah. different ways but but to say that um it is um not just about uh, religious fundamentalism it's not about who you pray only but i think overall the sense i get from uh, my friends and 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 others who live there um is a, basically the shrinking of choice mm. um so the the shrinking of choice on so many different levels um one must also sort of remember that um, when you are far away, you you tend to uh, look at a lot of negatives uh, in the sense that maybe you're not, yeah. because when you're not immersed in it, you, you don't fully appreciate that there are spaces opening up and it is not as um, stifling as it is. Maybe it's worse, but um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a complex um, feeling to articulate. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, things are broadly... Um, getting worse uh, in terms of liberties uh, yes in terms of liberties mm -hmm. uh, but there are spaces where where um, people are fighting back so so you in general you know we, we've read about it we've spoken about it um, that how institutions are failing key institutions are failing and uh, unlike my, my favorite example is uh, great things are not happening in the US but I think some of the American institutions are fighting back uh, because of the way they have been built, mm -hmm. uh, but but I would like to believe, and um, what I also get to hear from others is that there are spaces within institutions that are not totally 
uh, capitulating. Mm. Um, so, so I think um, it's a it's a complex picture, and uh, and Indian democracy. I believe, and I really, really hope that it is ingenu- ingenuous in ways that it'll spring a surprise. Um, you know, you we assume that it'll be very difficult to um, uh, you know uproot and uh, uproot and challenge some of the you know prevailing powers, but uh, you never know what what happens. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, but, you know, and but but the only, the only uh, you know, one, it's okay to be optimistic, but I think uh, um, one has to be guarded also in the way that uh, right now it's difficult to see where that kind of solution and that will come from. Will come from. Mm. Um, we you know yes we don't have we don't have a opposition to speak of, and we uh, don't have a functioning media. Uh, one can say that. Uh, you know, uh, like a free speech media. Uh, yes, uh, free speech media in the sense that, uh, of obviously the 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 spaces are shrinking, journalists are under, under mm. threat and so on and so forth. Um, but I think uh, I had even as a practicing journalist, I had forgotten the power of the media to be used as a propaganda tool. Oh I, yeah. y- You know, you read about yeah. it, uh, but you, when you live through it, you you will actually know what an um, effective and absolute instrument it is it is um so i think um so so it's it's the media non functioning of institutions um lots of different things coming together so so it's wrong to actually just say that okay we you know we have an authoritarian government in power but there are so many other factors that have come to shape indian society at this point so so the the solution actually uh yes politically you know it has to be organic and come from come from ground up mm-hmm. um but uh they ha- I, I feel that uh it appears that there are so many changes at the societal level that it's it's hard to say right now um how it's going to transform itself whether the changes of the last few years have been absolute as it appears to be or maybe not you know india is an extremely diverse and complex country Absolutely. and uh, you know and and uh I'm I'm an urban Indian in that sense, uh, but but rural India thinks completely differently, and it's just impossible to predict which way mm. such a large mass of people think and will behave in the future. Absolutely, and the numbers. And so, but the only thing is, you know, I think uh, the pandemic was an opportunity. Um, is it peaking now? I, I saw like uh, the case yesterday was sixty thousand. Um, it's India. hard to say what's a peak in a country of 1.3 billion people. <laughs> yes, uh, unfortunately, China is three. <laughs> so, so we don't know whether it's peaking. So, so what I was trying to say is that the the pandemic is an is an opportunity not just in India for you know for governments like India's, but also in other countries where you see that they're using the the pandemic as an opportunity to go after dissenters and um, and to basically tune up. Uh, this kind of uh, um, um, how do I say um, you know things that they would have thought w- was not so easy in a non-pandemic time. Mm-hmm. I think it's it's you know for instance now we are um, weakening our rules around environmental protection. Mm-hmm. I'm just giving you an example. Mm-hmm. This is not the time, you know, if anything, I think this pandemic has shown how we, have, we must protect the environment, um, you know, in order to protect our ecology so that we don't have diseases like this slipping uh, across species and so on. Um, but um, so so the, for some governments, the pandemic is an opportunity to further their goals. Mm-hmm. Um, but it may just so happen that the pandemic is actually an opportunity for voters to to assess uh, you know how the government has fared or failed and and then so so i feel that the mm-hmm. uh, to use a cliche the pandemic is a litmus test that actually shows uh, your governments worldwide mm-hmm, mm-hmm. have you been effective yes have falling. you been effective or not yeah and this is complex this is yeah. complex for the best of governments um so it's an extremely challenging time. So you have, you know, um, you have the the burden of a, a crashing economy, and then you have uh, basically so many people dying. Um, so it's it's a complex complex problem. But but I think um, 
it it will remain to be seen yeah how the government emerges and how the society changes as a result of this and of course this is not just about india right it's the same in so many other places in so many other places yes. you were talking about the founding father was gandhi part of uh, of these fathers yes yes and who were the other ones because that's the one who has been <laughs> mediatized um well i think um we we had um uh, our first prime minister uh, jawaharlal nehru um and uh, uh, b r ambedkar uh, you know who who uh, drafted the constitution and and a whole host, host of others um and and women as well um mm, they were saying that's only men there no no <laughs> uh, w- women as well um and um it it seems um it seems um it fe- seems really far away mm-hmm. uh i yes it was in another century but um i feel that um some of some of the criticisms was that um the founding fathers were too far away from the reality of the country but how can you be uh, close because as you said it's so diverse the north the south the region the, i mean in switzerland which is so small you have differences you know with the rural and the uh, urban areas so obviously it's it's the question is is it possible to govern a country with so so big with so many people and what is the actually actual um, power of the region because modi we feel like it's this you know strong man authoritarian but is it like um like france like a very centralized power well we um, you know we have uh, more than um 25 different uh, provinces uh, yeah. um and um, and as many uh, official languages and and hundreds and thousands of dialects and so yeah. on um so i think um on some of the key issues the states uh, continue to uh, retain the powers uh to to govern themselves um and i think um some of the as in every country and every region some of the you know one part of the country is richer and more developed than than the other part yeah. and there are a lot of obviously discussions about um uh, how uh, overall revenues get distributed and how they are invested and so on and so forth that will be the north more uh, the the richer. south is better developed the south is better developed okay um and and traditionally um uh, richer because of better oh, okay. yeah uh, traditionally better better governance and different kinds of social movements um and so on and so forth uh, every uh, state and region has a different uh, has a different story and and brings something unique to to uh, india as a country um uh, but uh, i think of in the recent years of course there has been a lot of discussion on the devolution of powers um and uh, i had the opportunity to actually grow up in different parts of the country which was not so common when i was growing up um so it was a fascinating experience that yes people can be very different from one part to another but when you come to switzerland uh, you see that you don't even share one national newspaper which is very hard for me to believe for instance uh despite being a very small country because mm-hmm. of the linguistic differences and mm-hmm. other cultural differences um but you know f- j- just speaking on the matter of national newspapers yes we had there was a you know there was a time where the whole country would read one newspaper different editions of course but um uh, you see what i'm saying so the, the, the it is so the question of whether it is uh can can one person govern it um i think i think uh the political structure was built in a way that uh people work together um so some states some of the provinces in india are bigger than brazil mm-hmm. you know bigger than a <laughs> population of brazil um and and then there's a there's a you know state in eastern india with more than a population of 100 million now grappling with the covid crisis like many other states uh but you see that the the numbers are big so the stakes are high yep and and the, the states uh are also where the forests and the uh, rivers and uh, you know um everything that can be monetized under a certain kind of agenda uh, so states also sort of um are responsible for that um so it's of course you know i mean ideally uh, what switzerland has which is this amazing uh balance of coalition politics that is something which is incredible and i think we we've discussed this before but um the the checks and balances that, like you have in switzerland uh 
of no one party actually acquiring too much power there's always uh, your, your federal council will will have uh, seven different candidates have who have to uh, work together work together yeah. yeah no matter no matter their political ideology um and that's that's such a such a great system so the question is of course people will turn around and say switzerland is a small country um and Extremely direct democracy rich. can direct democracy can work in such small numbers but not uh, not uh, uh, not in a big country like india but um sure that to some extent that's true but uh, but you know uh, i think um it is it can be it has mm. been governed before mm-hmm. and and um when we had a recent uh, elections in in 2019 uh, a lot of people were were trying to say that uh, it's we should not blame the lack of choice and we should look at uh, coalition politics as a as an alternative mm-hmm. so maybe that will be an inevitable outcome in the years to come what to to you know it, it will so happen for... that it will so happen that you know maybe some of the regional leaders will 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 be effective enough mm-hmm. to put their stake in yep. in running the government it has happened in the past and how and uh, when such configurations will form it's ex- ex- extremely complex but it's not a impossibility mm-hmm. why do you think the uh, modi was because there was a change before him um it was a different kind of politics what is the special the specificity of modi's politics um i think um uh, the ruling party um uh, is a is a consequence of you know uh, many decades um uh, of uh, the right wing movement mm. it has not happened uh, suddenly yeah um and uh, as you would see in in other countries that a number of factors came together uh for um for for the ruling party to actually capitalize on this political opportunity uh you know uh more than 80% uh, of the country is hindu so um so they have sort of managed to uh capitalize on this um so the specificity is is that um it is it it is uh, majoritarian and the specificity is that um they want to further the goals um uh, of of uh, of the majority um and they have basically successfully created um a sense of victimhood uh in the majority hmm. um the but minor- minority is uh, islam Uh, uh, Muslim, Muslim. We, we have Muslims, we have Christians, we have Buddhists, we have Jains. Um, uh, so it's that that group is diverse as well. Um, so, so I think um, how and you know um, I'm not a political expert, but obviously what what I'm you know I'm a, as a lay an observer as as you are. Um, but a lot of people believe that uh, how and when um, uh, you know. when there was this decisive shift to the right was a consequence of of a number of reasons including non performance by previous governments mm-hmm. yes so that was an enabling factor yeah mm-hmm. it would you compare trump bolsonaro and modi do you think there is similarities in the the way they came to power um being deceived by maybe promises broken promises of their predecessors um i think the disillusionment um the disillusionment of a vast majority uh definitely contributed to the victories of um uh, most of these leaders um so yes there is a similarity and and um in fact what i what i try to tell myself is that um what india is experiencing is um is unique in its own way but it's it also has parallels in so many different parts of the mm-hmm. country uh, so many different parts of the world yeah um so i think that uh, uh the forces that that have uh, contributed to the growth of populism political populism across the world those same forces continue right so, wing uh, okay. yes mm-hmm. and and i also think that the, it's 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 so predict- predictable in some sense and so mm-hmm. formulaic mm-hmm. so you have the sense of victimhood 
in majority of the people yeah. uh, or what seems like the majority of the people it may not be the majority of the people um uh, you know not everyone voted uh, yeah. f- for the government right so mm. it it mm-hmm. is just that it's significant enough to get them over the line but um so i think yes those those similar so i think i think these uh feelings and these values if you may want to call it so are universal these these feelings of being wrong these feelings of otherization a lot of people are are um using political ways to capitalize on on these kinds of uh, approaches and and uh, and it's no different in india than it is in other parts of the world mm-hmm the repression though um it seems to be quite brutal no they put people in jail they like is it violent is it true that is the repression is brutal or is it not um going by um going by uh reports of what mm-hmm. i've read uh, uh clearly because i don't have first hand information in that sense but talking to people and going by reports um yes it has been uh, it has been uh decisive and uh and decisive in the sense that there are no qualms about it uh no what there, there there are no you know there's no hesitation in uh-huh. using the powers mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. to to repress so um yeah but uh but i think um um it is across the board like i said it's not not only um uh repression of media or or uh, um or uh, lawyers or you know all of these uh, um you know people working in these professions have come under pressure um but uh, just the sense of repression you know a couple of years ago a teenage child a girl uh uh got got uh, booked for a facebook post i'm just giving you an example mm-hmm. um so so it's hard to uh read you know how do you define repression of this kind yeah um so it's uh, so it's deeply problematic it's it's not it's not just about it's not just about uh people who raise questions but but others as well um and and most recently of course um there were a lot of protests um against the citizenship amendment act and so on and so forth uh, which is I, i'm not sure which which, which is um uh basically makes uh distinctions um for um for who who basically can become a citizen of mm. india mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um especially those uh, uh coming from uh, other parts uh, of uh, uh southeast asia yeah well we have the same kind of problem <laughs> in switzerland when we discuss about who can be swiss, swiss or not eh? yeah so it's probably uh, uh but um so i think um those uh, those those events um you know just before the pandemic happened mm-hmm. i think it it was sort of reaching a crescendo there were a lot of organic uh, protests uh and people sort of on their own uh coming onto the streets across many cities in the country and in many parts of the world um mm-hmm. uh, indians from many parts of the world also came up um So so yes I think the the repression is is brutal and of course uh in Kashmir as well. Yeah that was the the next uh, next uh, topic. Uh Kashmir is a special place. Uh, I think that, w- that uh, it was tell me if I'm wrong but uh, it was created to kind of uh, put the zone between Pakistan and India. But that's maybe too simpli- simplistic so uh, can you tell me a bit more about Kashmir would come to I'm not you are not a historian but um you your understanding of the the region and what role should play and what happened from one year until now um well basically at the time at the time of independence um uh, a number of different provinces um uh, uh you know when they decided to join the Indian Union in that sense um had uh, various agreements mm-hmm. on so 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 it's not just that kashmir had some kind of a um uh, special special agreement they did but so did some other indian states mm-hmm. uh, which many people seem to forget um but uh, but that they they basically had certain protections uh, that um, you know in terms of uh, 
owning uh, public property and and um, having powers uh, uh, for a fair degree of uh, autonomy. Uh, so those powers were conditional on them joining uh, uh, India, and um, uh, that was a part of their accession agreement, as it were. Um, so basically, last year uh, the government decided to rescind those constitutional provisions. Mm -hmm. um, but th th you must remember that the in the lead up to last year, previous governments have also sort of um, not uh, um, dealt with uh, Kashmir in the right manner uh, by um, essentially uh, denying them uh, the right to uh, self de self determination. Uh, this is extremely extremely political. Um, uh, a lot of a lot of Indians. Uh, majority of the Indians believe that Kashmiris have no uh, right to self determination, mm -hmm. um, mm. and um, and uh, unfortunately, a lot of them celebrated uh, when when you know nearly eight million of the country countrymen and women were denied their constitutional uh, right. uh, uh, rights. Mm -hmm. So, but the the point is that uh, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, uh, Mistakes were committed by previous governments as well. Um, the, the Indian government or the Kashmir? No, the the, the Indian government, mm -hmm. um, and um, um, but I think what what happened last year was uh, was decisive in the sense that they they just decided to do away with any you know any pretense essentially. Mm -hmm. um, so since the early nineties. Uh, Kashmir has seen uh, a lot of violence um, and and repression on so many different levels, uh, unmarked graves and uh, basically generations lost because of terrorism and so on. Um, but last year, from last year, we you still don't have access to 4G uh, uh, in Kashmir. It's, you know, children haven't gone to school and. Uh, people are struggling to get medical, you know, access to emergency healthcare and so on and so forth. So um, unless you really are paying attention, it's very difficult to find out, uh, you know, for the world at large to find out what's happening in Kashmir because the the silence and the repression is so absolute. Mm -hmm. um, so, but but I think uh, a lot of what we are seeing in India in the rest of the country. Uh, is scary enough for us to even imagine what's happening in Kashmir. Yeah, you can imagine. Um, and I think China also, because now we're in Kashmir, there's a lot of influence from China, from Pakistan, now India. What is India's politics when it comes to geopolitics with the, the neighbors? Because the, the new alliance with Modi, find, you know, we are not used to Israel being ally, like friend with India. And now it seems there's some some collaboration going on and, and stuff. What do you see as um, as geopolitical um, differences now? India, what, what does India want? I guess like everyone wants to become part of the big picture. But why, what do you make of it? Um, I think... You know, sitting here in Geneva, normally India is um, uh, seen as uh, a middle power in that sense. Um, you know, along with uh, Brazil and so on. So you have mm -hmm. uh, U.S. and China, and then uh, uh, so India is actually seen as a middle power. Uh, with with respect to um, you know, we've had our traditional allies, as it were, uh, as far as you know, at, at the multilateral level. But um, uh, I think there's a block that called BRIC. Yes, BRICS. BRICS. Yes, so that's Brazil, that's right. Russia, India, and China, and South Africa. I think. Yes, BRICS, and um, um, I think um, as far as Southeast Asia, Asia is concerned, I feel that uh, a lot of our uh, understanding and assumptions about uh, India's role has changed in recent years. Um, so earlier we, we we were able to say that Bangladesh was an ally. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, recent politics, uh, I think, have have really uh, uh, called that into question. Uh, recent politics, and mostly uh, on account of India, uh, from from my limited perspective. So, so I think we've had sort of troubled relationships now with uh, Nepal and uh, mm. 
China and Bangladesh uh, and uh, and even the Maldives for instance so uh, so so geopolitically I think it really depends on 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 the context mm -hmm. um, so I think we have continued to maintain some of our traditional allies uh, but now you know recent developments with China you know it's it's really difficult to predict uh, how that's going to evolve in the future because we we nearly had a war with China kind of mm -hmm. a thing. So Yeah, with China and India, it's uh, I think a third of the world population. Yeah. That's that's huge. Yeah, so so we you know I think a lot is at stake including, you know, glacial rivers and so on and so forth. Mm. So um so there's more than meets the eye. Yeah, yeah. Um that's fascinating. But again, I see a pattern with um with populists like uh, USA and Brazil. Um when when you say MAGA make America first, for instance, uh, and then you close up to other countries, and I think that's a good thing uh, about Trump to me is that um, the the rest of the world started to see what US is really about. <laughs> you see, because the other one they do the same basically. The foreign politics, Trump foreign politics, or the rest of the world is the same. But now we see it so blatantly that we cannot. Be like, oh yeah, that's great, that's great. Let's work with them because it's so horrendous uh, what he says, what he does, um, and it may be the same with Modi too. Is like uh, populist, nationalist India. So it closed kind of the, the the borders, and it's harder to be friend with uh, China, with Bangladesh, with. So I think it's again there's a there's a pattern. Now the question I have is. What's next? Because now, as you said earlier, we've seen, now we, we see what's happening. We see the failure of this. Well, from an external perspective, maybe we see it, but I'm not sure from an internal perspective it's, we are able to see it. We'll, we'll, we'll see in, in November during the U.S. Uh, election, though it's not going to help to me. I, I don't think Biden can uh, like improve any situation yeah uh, I, th I think globally. what you what you mentioned about um, you know leaders closing uh, markets and lead leaders sort of closing their borders and yeah. so on and so forth um, I think a lot of it uh, is also the timing uh, and a lot of it is um, um, sort of short-term political gains yeah. right but uh, but you know these are these are big markets and uh they are also driven by different kinds of compulsions and and they have an intelligence of their own so i i'm not i'm not sure that um i'm not sure that you know any one particular leader can actually come to come to change the trajectory of how a country has been behaving and trading mm -hmm. um overnight uh, not. so 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 i feel that uh um for instance, this rise in protectionism, uh, you know, you see, th you see that in, in international trade, uh, you know, making it more difficult to uh, export and import and so on and so forth mm -hmm. by, by, by levying duties um, and, and uh, making these as trade disputes. Um, but in the end, you know, I feel that uh, uh, companies and, and economies want a certain semblance of... Uh, uh, balance mm -hmm. and systems to work. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, 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 I have a feeling that uh, sooner than later it'll it'll come back to to sort of a e equilibrium of sorts, especially post COVID. Mm -hmm. No, that's interesting. An open question to me. I'm kind of favorable for protector protectionism. I understand uh, this uh, this idea of you know, um, making the local business uh, more important than global business and everything. But now the aggressivity towards the other one, they close up to say, we better than you. And I don't think that's the attitude we, we should have. We should protect, obviously, the, the local, but with a more uh, uh, attractive or more, uh, I don't know how to say, a positive attitude towards the the foreign or the external. 
Yeah, sure. I think I think um, if you if you look at uh, if you look at the pandemic, um, uh, increasingly a lot of countries will decide to uh, to be more self reliant, uh, especially mm-hmm. for supply chains yeah. of medicines and so on and so yeah. forth. Uh, you know, seventy percent of uh, active instance. exactly um, mass two and seventy percent of the active pharmaceutical in- ingredients. Uh, um, are uh, you know uh, made in China, mm-hmm. and a lot exactly. of countries are dependent on those yeah. essential sort of access to those essential goods. So, so there'll be new ways of thinking about, um, you know, what what this means for the future, and how countries should become self reliant. So, so I think there's a there's a there's a balance. Um, so, so the, the so the politics will also obviously define uh, how economics and trade will be shaped. Yeah. Uh, between these some of these major powers yeah and uh, what about the future of uh, india that's a that's a big question as well but, um when is the next um next dates for possible change so, like election or i don't yeah, know yeah um 2019 uh was, was the, when they came to power so basically it's a f- five year it's a five year yeah okay what prospect do you see for for india um i i'm an optimist Mm-hmm. So, so, uh, idea, yeah. so, so, so we'll see. Uh, so we'll see how uh, it's it's uh, too early to predict. Uh, I think we are we are still very much in the in the throes of uh, um, a very one sided kind of uh, political uh, outcome right now. Mm-hmm. Um, um, also, you must remember that um, uh, a lot of the recent changes in campaign finance. Uh, how elections are fought uh, are are overwhelmingly in favor of the ruling party. Um, so it's uh, there's a there's a flood of money. So it's hard to predict uh, hard to predict uh, things like elections and so on. Mm-hmm. So unless you have like such a groundswell uh, against the government, you will not be able to uh, overbalance it. All. Yeah. Mm. Usually, it's the economic situation that um, dictate the results, or, or if these kind of rulers stand or not. And I think Trump is going to lose, um, not because the general uh, thought or ideology in USA changed, but because COVID wasn't handled properly, and then therefore the economy is going to. Have a, suffer a big hit from it, and because of these two things, I think it won't have enough supports, and then it will go the other side, which is not really the other side in USA. Eh? It's kind of similar. Yeah, but um, uh, yes, I think uh, as far as the US is concerned, maybe we can make some calculated guesses on on mm. how it may change. Um, but but economics uh, economic compulsions don't always dictate political choices even though the voters may be at the receiving end. And that's what the recent elections told us. Because we we had uh, demonetization uh, in 2016, where 86% of the currency in circulation was demonetized o- you know, overnight. Uh, what does that mean? So, so let's say um, you have 100 francs in circulation, mm-hmm. coins and notes yep. right now. And uh, the government decides that uh, you cannot uh, use certain coins and certain kinds of notes, uh, let's say denominations of 20 and so on. But it'll it'll basically end up, uh, you know, delegitimizing 86% of, you know, eight, 86 francs in circulation in the economy overnight. You you say you, you have you the money, but you cannot use it. Can um, you exchange it somewhere, somehow? Uh, well, that was a long, complicated process. But the fact is that people lost their uh, savings overnight. Mm. And... Um, and that, you know, that was a fatal blow to the informal economy. Uh, you know, more than 90% of India's workforce is in the informal economy. Yeah. People save under pillows to an extent um, and so on. But um, I think um, that did not uh, make an impact uh, on the average Indian voter because that was seen as a move to crack down on corruption. Mm-hmm. So uh, this so is it was this legitimized. Yes, it it people is. People accepted it. Yes, people accepted mm. it because it was seen. It was you know the the story they were told that this is this is going to fight uh, corruption and it's going to, uh, you know. Uh, yeah. Did it do that? 
Did did work? So so no, it did not. It did uh-huh. not. But uh, but the the optics mattered. So so okay. Mm-hmm. So all I'm trying Get to tell you is that yeah. the the economic situation uh, is important. But yeah, but we cannot take it for granted mm-hmm. that uh, the hungry voter will not be political yeah, in that sense. However, the pandemic. uh maybe a complete game changer mm. because people are not even alive anymore uh in that sense to uh you see what i'm saying that it's more dramatic yeah it's um, scary as well yeah mm. so uh so we'll have to we'll have to see uh, uh the outcomes of the outcomes of the next election much will depend on on whether the opposition is actually able to come up and sort of capture capture the imagination is of the is it like um two parties kind of a system or is it more complicated no that? it's more no, complicated it's more. that there, there are basically hundreds of yeah. political parties but of course two you know some major uh, some major players uh, at the at the national level uh-huh. uh, but that's what makes it so fascinating yeah. um so to understand from outside yeah. when you but, but but the you know driven by different kinds of considerations different kinds of social uh, social mixes and so on and so forth um but uh, no it's a complex question but but sure we can be optimistic about uh, yeah. india and about the us and the, and, and and the the economy in india is, what can we say about the economy is it going right it wasn't doing well even before the pandemic mm-hmm. and uh, and you know the, the best economies are uh, are suffering i know so um, so it's uh, it's it's hard to say how um, how it will pick up of course the indian market is is big enough in itself that you know it it can sort of continue to service itself no. um but um, no it isn't going well it isn't going yeah. well um it's 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 cru- crucial because uh, we've had uh, you know major parts of the country uh, you know not un- some some under strict lockdown and some not but let's say uh, for the last 4 or 5 months uh, a lot of people who would depend on uh, daily wages to make their ends meet have not had had income mm-hmm. um but the extreme poverty is it's part already of india for a long time no it, it is a it, it you know yes it is uh, you know uh, we have um, uh, by some some estimates uh, you know at least uh, 200 to 300 million people uh, who would actually they say that you know they are just above the 2 dollars a day uh, um, yeah. world bank uh, mm-hmm. you know above the poverty poverty line mm-hmm. but something like the pandemic actually pushes millions of people under the poverty line yes Yes. Uh so so obviously um and this is not just about India right this is worldwide um yeah. uh, people are not able to people are not able to work people are not able to go to school so so we'll have to see uh uh how deep an economic impact it's going to make and and the and the resilience of you know you know emerging economies to actually come back uh and how soon they'll come back mm-hmm. that's that's also a question i have uh at what point the people revolt you know if there is what a billion p- poor people in in india or i don't know 200 mi- well, 100 million poor in usa or i don't know in switzerland 4 million poor then when are the people going to rise up and say we'll now do differently it's it, i'm sometimes i'm be naive and hoping you know people will say enough but i don't see any of this maybe in usa a little bit now but i don't know um i think um they you know during the during the lockdown period in india we we saw uh, scenes of uh, in in certain parts of the country people fighting for food um, mm. Did you see um that? Wow. Uh, uh we we saw that and 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 in some other parts of the world as well but but i think the you know at at what point um people will actually it really depends on agency it really depends on whether people can afford to revolt yeah but i mean when you've lost everything you you can't afford because yeah i mean sure but but under it's it's you know under what circumstances and you know i think it's it's a, it's a terrible choice whether you want to live to see another day yeah yeah that's true but 
when every morning you don't know if you're going to die. I don't know where, you know. It's hard to imagine here because we, we have such an amount of wealth and uh, we secure and uh, the, the hospital are working. We, have, we, we know for sure we'll have food. Um, we have uh, insurances, everything. We have poor people. 10% of the Swiss people are considered poor. But you understand that's not the same poverty. I mean, we're not talking about two francs per day. Yeah. Um, so it's, yeah, from again, from an external point of view, if, if tomorrow the situation, the Swiss situation was like the Indian situation, we will revolt. But it's because the difference is so big. Yeah. But when you turn the, the heat slowly, you know, the, <laughs> the, the story about the, the frog that, uh, if you put it in the hot water, it jumps. But if you slowly yeah. put the the warmth, uh, then it just stay and die. So I don't know. When I, I, I think mm-hmm. the ahead. the example is you know when the Arab Spring started. Um, I think if I'm not mistaken, there was a vegetable seller in Tunisia, uh, uh, who I think self immolated himself. Uh, yes. Yeah. And then yeah, it that, that like was that. like that a, was a that was like a yeah that was like a tipping point. But yes. but the incident itself, you know, what prompted that was, mm-hmm. um, if I'm not mistaken, fairly. Um, uh, it was like a skirmish, if I'm not mistaken, and, but that that led to a whole series of events. Yes. So I feel that what you know, it can something small can actually trigger a, a, a domino effect. Yes. So what that is going to be in a country as diverse as India, again, the definition of who is poor, even within India, can change a lot. Mm. Um, so some places don't have hospitals; people are dying at home. Some places do have hospitals so it's uh, highly uneven mm-hmm. even within states yeah. and provinces and region um, yeah. and um, so so it's not going to be a, okay we, we, we are going to see some kind of a some kind of a change or a revolt and so on and so forth mm. um, I think you know culturally also this this power to ask questions and the power to ask for your rights yeah uh, that that language and that behavior, um, we've we've had it in India uh, for for, for uh, uh, you know decades. Um, India as we know it, but um, but that's that that consciousness and power is not uh, uh, uniform. It really depends. So so if you if you talk to environmental activists, mm-hmm. you will see that there's a high consciousness. Of protection of the environment and fighting for envi- environmental rights yes. amongst uh, you know indigenous people, amongst people in the forests, uh, but you will not find uh, many people in the cities uh, tr- you know being more vocal about the rights. So so this yeah. this consciousness also differs. Yes. Uh, just just giving you the example from from uh, from uh, environmental issues. Um, yeah, I love uh, one of my favorite activists, uh, feminist activists, Vandana, Vandana Shiva. Uh, she's a world-leading figure. I mean, she's one of the bravest women on earth, I think. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, but it obviously, it's not shared by, by the entire India. Like, it's more raw, you mean? Um, n- not for sure. You, you have a lot of people uh, also in, you know, urban India who, who are working working on these issues mm. now more than more than ever before. Uh, but but what I'm trying to say is that yes, there has been a tradition, uh, but this this kind of consciousness is not something, uh, it's not something uniform. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, it's very very cultural yeah. and can and be very specific to the local context. And that's why a revolution needs to like uh, talk to everyone. Uh, it has to be a common issue, and yeah. it's too maybe diverse for one. Yeah billion people to rise up <laughs> yes exactly yeah, okay. which is uh, funny the way point. you <laughs> say it uh, but uh, we, we also discussed empathy uh-huh. and that also ties into the you know this shared sense of uh, shared sun- sense of suffering um, and uh, appreciation of what the other person is going mm-hmm. through so but uh, so but uh, but in a deeply divided country you you need something which which actually unites yeah, people. Yeah, sure. Um, so the lack of access to health infrastructure may be one such moment. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah, fascinating. 
Um, obviously, one of the biggest difference with the culture Indian or European Swiss is we are very individualist, individualistic here. Everyone think about his own, you know, personal. It's very different there. The the culture is more communal, communal. I don't know how you say that in English. Yeah. Um, so the the solution are not the same either. Like the, it's a huge differences, and so what we think can work here is not maybe efficient. Who will not work there? Uh, the the, well, the I think recipe of Switzerland may not be the recipe for India, but yeah. what do you think? No, but I think it. See, it works for it works for Switzerland. You've devised a way of understanding and working with each other. Mm. Uh, we understood so, the danger of power, so we shared it as much as we could. Yeah, the danger of absolute power. Yes. Yes. So that's uh, that's that's fascinating. Um, this also this uh, you know thing of referendums. Yeah. And also yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, you know articulating your uh, uh, your views mm -hmm. at very local levels. That's. That's hugely empowering. Okay, don't you don't there is no such a tool in India like for locals. No, you, that you're aware of. There, there are there are laws that uh, mandate uh, consulting local populations mm -hmm. on a variety of issues, but most often. Okay, just like yeah, they're not followed and so on and so forth. So yeah, okay. When you you're a journalist, so I guess you you read a lot, listen a lot. Why is your main source of information where do you educate yourself to keep track with everything um right now i can sound really shallow and say twitter <laughs> <laughs> it's not you're not the first one who would say that actually and i, I do too a little bit so uh no i'm i'm only half kidding so um i think as far as um uh you know, working, uh, let's say, writing about, reporting about global health and so yeah. on. It's fascinating um, that uh, a really nerdy community like Global Health uh, mm -hmm. oh, is yeah. actually so active on Twitter. Um, and I find it a great place to connect with um, uh, potential readers and, you know, reading expert analysis mm. and so on. It's also fairly technical um, in the sense that you often will not open a big media publication to read about global health. Yes, now, but not earlier. You mm. see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, so that's uh, that's one for the daily reading. And uh, for the for the last uh, decade or more of having left India, I still continue to read uh, Indian newspapers just to mm -hmm. keep an eye. Um, that would be in English? That would be in English, mm -hmm. yes. That would be in English. Um, um, and... Um, I do read Indian newspapers and I, and of course, uh, read some of the major um, other English newspapers, including, uh, you know, New York Times and Financial Times um, and, and uh, The Guardian. Um, I try to read uh, nonfiction, uh, but uh, try to not read something that I'm working on uh, because I want to uh, sort of... Um, uh, I want to um, know about other things other than what I'm working on. Um, it tends to be nonfiction and it tends to be fairly boring, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> depends on depends on what you, yeah. you know. Uh, so I, I'm reading something on, uh, I've been reading something on trees now for a long time. Trees? Yes, like, on trees. Okay, um, forests. Yeah, on forests and trees. Interesting. Yeah, I find it uh, really, really uh, refreshing. Um, it, it was interesting because I was a botany student and at that point I had no oh. interest in trees. Yeah. Uh, and now I <laughs> kind no, of I regret. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's fascinating. So basically a lot of uh, um, ecologists have taken it upon themselves mm. to talk about trees. Mm -hmm. and, and, yeah. and especially living in such a beautiful country and being surrounded by trees. Um, it's just One a third of Switzerland is a... Uh, first yeah mm -hmm. it's incredible so 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 i think uh, so I, as an example you know i yes f I, right now i'm reading a lot about trees uh, for the last few years i've been trying to sort of uh, know more and more about this mm. uh, as an example yeah you were talking about twitter i have a grief against twitter uh, since uh, a week now have you seen what they've done they're now quoting they're not calling the media 
uh, they give names, but only to Chinese or Russian media. It's, it says, like, for instance, RT, which everyone knows because it's Rush, Russia TV. We know it's a state-owned TV. But now you can see on RT uh, Twitter, uh, state-affiliated media. And you would think uh, if if they would put transparency, because that would, that's what they say they want to do through that, then they would do the same with the BBC, you know, yeah. state-affiliated media, English state-affiliated media. But no, it's only Chinese and Russian. So I thought there was quite some hypocrisy going on here, but I think everyone can see that through. But um, I also use uh, Twitter, but I'm not naive enough to to think, you know, the, well, it's di diverse, depends who you follow, actually. Yes. Uh, and I think it's a good door to to dig and see. But you know the problem with them, um, algorithm that only show you what they think you like to yeah. see or hear. I think I think like all big um, technology companies, uh, we have to be really aware of uh, the power of such mediums. Yeah. Um, so we use it um, only to further some ends, such as uh, sort of keeping track on what's happening or mm. what you're interested in. Um, so sure, you have you have to be acutely aware of uh, uh, the double edgedness of there this. There is, and I think also if you get, which is not our case obviously, but if you get a big following um, group, then it becomes something else. You see, because you're following or something, so it's it's now a tool to, yeah, to diffuse your information in your world, and therefore you become one part of. The problem, I think, True. Uh, which sure. is too much power on these big uh, GAFAM, uh, and that's the, the people who decide basically a lot. Yeah, <laughs> including who votes for whom. Exactly, and we've, we've heard that, uh, and it's, it's going to be more and more every, every time, and we can see the price of, uh, of an election. I've heard that uh, the US election is priced at 1 billion. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, you could see you could see that there's too much power in, in the hand of a few, and these ones are not even elected. We were talking about Modi before; he's elected at least. It's not perfect; it's far from it. But when guys, because they just I had an idea, which is not entirely an idea their in the idea. college dorm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then it becomes that. That's quite frightening to me. Uh, but it's hard to. To find alternatives, I think, because then you can go to Mastodon. I think it's a, yes. it's a different algorithm or a platform for that. But mm -hmm. when you're media, like you're a journalist, and you want to, to reach an audience, then, yeah, you, you, know, you know, you go where they are. Yes, you, you sort of uh, play into the game. Exactly. So that's a problem thing for us too um, in the Swissbox conversation and thinking about that. But for now, we're building as you uh, are with your, your blog. Is your blog uh, going well? You've uh, worked a lot these last three months. Um, yes, like everybody else, I guess. Um, it's, been, it's been interesting and very encouraging to also get uh, feedback from my readers mm -hmm. uh, that they want uh, this kind of uh, um, comprehensive analysis yeah. um, but still very spe specific yeah extremely specific extremely specific so the re readership is not going to be uh, tremendous in that sense but mm -hmm. uh, these are important uh, issues that may seem technical from outside but they are they affect you know our lives yeah. including the medicines we take mm -hmm. and whether or not uh, you, or what price we pay for our medicines and so on and so forth so so these are technical issues but they're important um, uh, there are um, uh, able competitors who, who who write on these things, but but I'm um, uh, trying to uh, tell the stories in a way that um, others may miss out on you know certain certain uh, certain kinds of angles and certain kinds of perspectives. So my effort has been to uh, pull together what I see into some form of a coherent narrative, mm -hmm. uh, and I and I think that. Um, uh, if I don't tell the story that I'm meant to tell, no one and no one else will. Mm -hmm. So, um, so we'll see how it goes. Yeah, that's great. So we will put the link uh, above the the video. Uh, Thank you of your of your podcast. 
And uh, beside that, what what is um, in the news? What takes your uh, intention lately? <laughs> um, I think um, what I've realized is that um, I'm trying to um, I'm trying to actually um, I won't say um, read less, but read uh, more consciously, mm -hmm. uh, and trying to think more about what I read. Uh, I think we. We are uh, just so inundated with information. Um, so I, I actually, of of the last few months, I think like everyone else, I've been totally um, tied down to my uh, professional duties of reporting as a journalist, and not mm -hmm. so much about um, not so much about reading what I want to read. But but having said that, I mean we live in an incredible age where we have so much of information and such great such everything. great writers and the access to access to uh, access to what what we would call as truth uh, access to what we would call as facts uh, it's it's an incredible age to live in um, but it's also a tragedy that uh, you know facts don't matter <laughs> but it is more disillusioning if you are in the business of uh, you know writing about facts if you if you're you know writing about things as they unfold and so on and so forth um so we, which 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 is kind of you know a question back to you which is that mm -hmm. when facts cease to matter you know yes you can read what you want to read and the algorithm will give you what you want to read uh, but when facts don't matter how would you actually build a credible alternative yeah but i i i understand your question i i don't it's not such a problem for me um i'm not so worried about it um because i, I think there were always facts but always if, as soon as you think about a fact you make it your own and then it becomes somehow uh, subjective to some extent now it's more than ever So there's an answer to me for that is that just take what you think is a fact and discuss discuss it you know openly and uh, with kindness with time also because if you have only 10 seconds to speak about something it's going to be hard to discern what is the truth if there's such a thing and what is not true or what is factual and what is not factual um So we have to reinvent, and that's why you also made this podcast, to because we understand that there are facts, but that's the, the hard science that exists. And that's not enough. But that's not enough. We need to take it, read it, understand it, discuss it, share it, compare, uh, you know, com confront as well, and then decide what we take as a fact for our own. And everyone experience to me, is a fact but is a fact only for me but is my experience cannot be a fact for you you know what I, what i mean so it's very complicated but i don't see it as a definitive problem i mean we can but we need to take the time and 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 also change the attitude toward it because normally the attitude toward the fact is i'm right you're wrong and i'm going to prove to you that i'm right but if we change that and say why do you think You're right. Without trying to convince me of anything, just in really willing to understand the the person that you're discussing with, I think we can try to reconcile. Again, that can't be naive, and um, maybe it's a luxury because in Switzerland we have this luxury to take the time, you know, without dying basically from authoritarian authoria, authoritarianism. Or because we don't have food, and you know we we were not in a hurry, so we're very very lucky. So to me, the the non-fact or the for, fake news, I don't I don't see it directly as a problem. But it may also be because I'm a, of the top in the food chain. I would say you know I'm a white man, privileged, rich, and everything. So that's uh, that's very interesting. I agree that we have to take time to talk about facts. Uh, without getting into a debate exactly. of uh, your fact versus my fact, mm -hmm. um, so like for instance in India, like in other places, there has been a, a lot of efforts towards uh, checking misinformation. 
Uh, this this spawned a whole movement yeah, of fact checking, yeah. which has been incredibly helpful, uh, incredibly helpful for the record. To what extent it is changing, uh, you know, false news and um, political perspectives, we don't know. But it it is, I feel, a legitimate tool uh, to counter uh, untruth. And yeah, I agree. But we need also to be careful because every time we put an authority that can decide which is which, then we remove this authority from everyone's. Because look, this authority said it's true or it's not true. Who's who? Who decide that? And how did they discuss? Do we have access to the discussion? Who led to the decision that is true or not true? All this kind of stuff. So I'm also, you know, I don't really like too much authority telling me. What is true or not? I understand. We need to put tools that allow us to check. But still, the final person who can decide if it's true or not is everyone's decision. Yeah, sure. I I think technology makes it possible. Yeah. Right. You can you can find out yeah. deep fakes. You can find out um, you know whether a exactly. particular video is doctored or not, and so on. Um, And um, we use a tool that is called Captain Fact. It's for now. It's it's not as useful as as it should be, but when when we say something that it's supposed to be factual, like a number or you know a date or something that is, uh, we report it on a website, and there's a community who is going to check. Right. And then they could they put link comments. They can discuss, argue, and everything. Right. But everyone can do that. And then once they've um, they've agreed or not agreed, then a, there's a green light, a green dot, if the argument is um, um, recognized as right, and a red light, a red light when it's not. Yeah. And then when you watch the video, like if you watch the podcast, you can add these um, these. Uh, um, how do you say this tool mm-hmm. to to the lecture, yeah. and you can see the dots, green or red, when you say it doesn't mean it's true or false. It means it may not be complete or accurate when it's right. red, and therefore you need, if you want to know, you need to do to, your own homework exactly, yeah. mm-hmm. because I think the the purpose of all that is not to to say oh I'm right or you're right. It's like do you understand why these people think that? Yeah, and what do you want to think? Yeah. And I think that's the empowerment. The future generation, I hope, is going to think critically. Not this person say this, therefore I believe it. But this is interesting. I understand where it comes from. And here's what I believe. Right. And that would be a success. I, I think um, what I found very... Uh, it's It's counterintuitive. But even, like I said, even when we have access to... Uh, a lot of tools today to yeah. find out whether something yeah. is a fact or not. For instance, now even uh, at the height of the pandemic, um, a lot Maybe of maybe. governments are fighting misinformation yeah. around the pandemic. Mm-hmm. But this is this is not surprising because it's a product of uh, the events of the last few years yeah. of how easy it has become to manufacture um, untruths and fake news and so on. Yeah. Uh, but this is super serious because this is a pandemic. Um, and we need to have the right kind of uh, information. People need to have the right kind of access to the right kind of information. Absolutely. So this is more widespread than uh, than 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 your fact versus my fact, because there is only one truth. You know, one can get infected if you don't wash hands and wear masks yeah, and yeah, so yeah, on yeah. and so forth. But but uh, so it's it's a bit more um, it's a bit more complex. No, I think, and you can see that uh, the discussion even in Switzerland with the mask and. No mask and people are now. You can hear crazy things from both sides sometimes, right? Eh? Uh, we're gonna have to put mask everywhere even outside. To me, that is crazy. Or the other side is like we they are creating a vaccine in order to put some device within the vaccine that may uh, allow them to follow you everywhere to know everything of you as if they did not already with you know that. <laughs> Uh, you can hear crazy stuff, but it's okay. I think it's good to hear them. I, I'm not for repressing any of it. 
Yeah. And um, and I think it, when you try to educate about critical thinking, you need to be focused also on the patterns. Like, who said what from where? What is the last thing this person said? Not to discredit or anything, but just to, um, I guess, give your own credibility to the person. Maybe her life is something... I'm not. I'm against this cancel culture huh, to say, "Oh, 20 years ago he said something, so you should never listen." Because if you do that, you're not allowing anyone to evolve ever, and we should give the room to evolve. But if someone says most of the time like crazy shit, then we need to say, "Okay, I'm gonna maybe hear that if I have time, or not," and then but understand where it comes from. That's also very important. So I think the perseverance. And the credibility is something that needs to be built. Because crazy person can say incredible rights and true facts. That's possible, technically. But the opposite is also possible. Person that always says something very accurate, right, and useful, suddenly says something that is completely out of reality. That's what is uh, hard. Uh, it's very interesting what you said about patterns. Because uh, one one can find a pattern, uh, you know, in sort of anti-science positions. And then uh, when you're consistently anti-science and anti-logic mm. or what one one understands as rational, then there are patterns that follow Usually, the yeah. consequences of such thinking and actions. Yeah. And that's frightening. Yeah, you you have an idea in, in mind. You have an example for that. Oh, what do you think? Well, like, well, I think you you brought out vaccines, for instance. Yeah, this one is very touchy, very emotional. It, it is very emotional, but this is just 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 an example, and this is you know in many different parts of the world. Yeah. So, um, so we have today vaccines for uh, you know for the diseases that we know, but having vaccines have not solved. The f have not prevented these diseases from happening yeah. because in some instances the diseases have come back because of these kind of uh, uh, feelings around vaccines and so that's like for instance measles and so on we haven't been able to prevent measles in many different parts of the world from what we hear because of uh, this kind of anti-vaccine uh, movement so, so, so there's a pattern to Uh, what you say that this mm. you know a consistent anti-science position yeah. consistent opposition to facts consistent burying of facts uh, or not looking the other way when when you yeah, know yeah. citing numbers Understand. this lack of respect for numbers uh, mm. th that characterizes a lot of populist democracies that's true but I'm trying to also understand where I come from and I think the um The lack of trust of the authority is also a fact, you know? Like, can we believe our politician? Some politician we know he can. Some system we know it's oppressive, it's egoistic. I mean, Trump, would you believe him? No. And then the same authority is telling you we need to vaccine. So you understand the pattern there and why some people can be like reactive to that because they think because it is saying shit all the time then this true or not true should you know we, we we take it as a whole when we need to really think for ourselves every time even if it was wrong all the time or even if it was right all the time and that's the problem and for the measles i think uh, i think it's so complex because a can india Or Switzerland is a complete different problem with measles, with with health. So you cannot say that, as we discussed earlier, that like vaccine will be the ultimate solution every time, everywhere, in any case. So there is also some uh, question and discussion that we need to have with that. But since it's so sensitive, people are refusing. And if you start saying the opposite of what they think, Well, it's the war. I could, I, I had myself uh, had this experience because I'm skeptical with vaccine. My kids are vaccinated, but not from for every disease because I think every disease need to be thought 
in a perspective with detailed reflection right. and everything. But man, it's very hard to discuss that because when you talk about vaccine with other parents and you say, well, I didn't vaccine for that, for that, they hear that I'm accusing them to do a wrong choice for the child. Therefore, I'm accusing them of being bad parents. That's what they hear. I would never do that. Because I think everyone's choice, I respect. So if you vaccine your kids and you thought about it, then good for you. That's great. I did the same and I choose maybe to do it differently. But because we accuse in, in, in doing differently, it's like we accuse the other of being wrong because we have this short-minded thing to do. This is right or this is wrong. But it could be both right because you <laughs> chose it, you know. So it's complicated and we should be be nice with each other <laughs> that's my answer actually actually and and understand where do you come from why did you decide that and i think the the new generation has to do that by obligation because as you said earlier the amount of information you can find is so big and you can hear everything and it's opposite you're like well how i am i going to make a decision with that well you're forced to choose and maybe our generation our, our parent generation they didn't have this uh, obligation to choose because that was it the authority said that yes we have no way to to confirm or not yeah and i'm hoping that the revolution that is coming is, is this critical thinking but well, let's see eh? Yes, do critical thinking. Exactly. And uh, the last question we like to to ask in this um, in this podcast is, um, wh where do you take your energy from? It's like, wh what is your main source of inspiration? What drives you in the morning and helps you to write your blog or to go for uh, forward with what you do in your life? Um. I think off late, um, it has been my son. Yeah. Um, you know, you Small want Small spirit, two years old. Two years late. old. Um, you know, you, you, it just puts, uh, puts it in perspective that uh, you're, you're trying to uh, build a world for the future mm. kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. um, you want to play your part by um, living right and doing, trying to do what you can. Um, But but I think um, it's it's very uh, important uh, for me to uh, spend some time by myself every now and then. Um, I sort of draw my inspiration and strength. Um, um, you know, solitude is a big part of mm -hmm. um, sort of recharging myself. Um, and I said, as I said earlier, I'm fortunate to live in Switzerland. Uh, lots of nature. Um, mm -hmm. So you know, growing up in urban India. One one does not have access to uh, a lot of nature, but uh, but it's almost as if uh, this has like totally changed us. Uh, it's so easy to recharge ourselves by going for a walk in the woods or uh, you know walking by the lake. So we are, we are extremely um, fortunate to have access to nature. So I think uh, nature has come to play a very big role in terms of. Uh, Uh, inspiring, inspiring me, inspiring my work. It's uh, I, I look forward to sort of engaging with nature, and and I know that this is this is a huge huge luxury. Um, so I, I fully sort of acutely conscious of that, and I really appreciate that. Um, and uh, and I, I I draw my inspiration from a lot of people all over the world. You know, right now mm. doing, you know. People, you know, all, all those uh, healthcare workers, doctors, um, and uh, you know, people who haven't slept enough in the last six months. Um, so I think there is no uh, dearth of inspiration um, from people who are working so hard, and often with far less resources uh, than I have. Mm. Uh, that's that's a constant um, sort of source of inspiration for me, um, and. Uh, um, And there's so many, so many, so many wonderful, selfless people. Um, I think that's, uh, you know, th such people aspire, uh, you know, they, they inspire you to become a better person. Uh, and, and all these people are within your reach. 
mm-hmm. <laughs> at least in this day and age. Yes, and we had one today. Thank you very much, Pretty Patnaik, for being that soul with us today um, for this podcast. We hope we're gonna have many other beautiful souls like you in the future. And again, we'll find you. Where, where can we find you on your? So uh, you can um, uh, find my uh, website. It's called Geneva Health Files. Uh, it's genevahealthfiles.wordpress.com, and uh, you can also follow me on Twitter, which uh, you don't like very much. Yes, yeah, <laughs> I do like it. I'm just cautious. Yeah, sure. Uh, I tweet at at Pratpat. Um, yeah, and uh, thanks a lot for having me. It's been a pleasure to talk about a range of uh, issues with my neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> awesome to have you. See you next time. Yeah, bye-bye. Bye-bye.